Now we would be having the question and answer session. We would like you to kindly understand and observe the rules that have to be followed during the question and answer session so that we can derive the maximum benefit from it. Three mics have been provided for the questions from the audience, two down here below for the gents and one up in the center in the balcony for the ladies. One question at a time will be put on the mic. The first question being asked by the lady on the top, then we move down to the brother on my right hand side, then we move up again to the next lady in the balcony, we move down on my left hand side to the next brother here, and similar fashion, we move up and down in the center on the top and on the two sides below. Written questions on slip papers, which are available from volunteers standing in the aisles, will be given a second preference after the questions on the mic have been answered by Dr. Zakir. Questions asked should be on the topic Women's right in Islam, modernizing or outdated only. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point, preferably in one to three sentences. This is a question and answer session, not a lecture or a debate session. Only one question at a time may be asked. If time permits us, we may allow you a second chance after the others have completed their chance. In the interest of having a less time wasting, a more educative and an interesting question and answer session, our decision to allow or disallow irrelevant questions or time wasting questions will be final. In the interest of eliciting a proper and clear answer from our speaker, kindly state your name and designation before putting forward your question. Your name and designation before you put forward your question so that we can give you a more appropriate answer. Thank you. We start our question and answer session. Dr. Zakir Naik ready at his mic. The questioners ready at theirs. May we have the first question from the ladies in the balcony. Assalamu My name is Sabah and I am a student. I would, ask, uh, would like to ask you a question, Ms. Dr. Pai. A man will have hoor, that is beautiful maidens, when he, go, uh, when he enters paradise. What will a um, woman get when she enters paradise? The sister has posed the question <coughs> that when a man enters paradise, he will get hoor, that is a beautiful maiden. What will the woman get? When she enters paradise, <coughs> the Quran has mentioned the word hur in no less than four different places. <coughs> it's mentioned in Surah Dukhan, chapter number 44, verse number 54. It's mentioned in Surah Tur, chapter number 52, verse number 20. It's mentioned in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 72, as well as in Surah Waqiyah. Chapter number 46, verse number 22. And many of the translations, especially 
the Urdu translations have translated the word Hur as beautiful maiden. If the word Hur means a beautiful maiden, it means a beautiful maiden, then what will the woman get in paradise? Actually, the word Hur is a plural for Ahwar, which is applicable to the man, and Hawar, which is applicable to the woman. And it signifies the characteristic of Hawar, which means big, white, beautiful eye, and describes especially the whiteness of the eye. The similar thing is mentioned as Azwaj al Mutaharin, many places in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse number 25, and so in Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 57, it says, Azwajin Mutaharatun, which means companion, pairs. So the word Hur is rightly translated by Muhammad Asad as spouse and also by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali as companion. So Hur actually means a companion or a spouse. It has no gender. For the man, he will get a good lady with big beautiful eyes and for a woman she will get a good man with big beautiful eyes. I hope that answers the question. The brother on my right hand side please. Assalamu alaikum. Sultan Kazi, I am in service. Uh, I would like to pose a certain question to Dr. Zaki Naik. For evidence given to, to prove evidence, why are there two female witnesses against one male witness? The brother asked a very important question. That why are two women witness equal to one witness in Islam? Two women witnesses are not equal to one woman witness. Two women witnesses are not equal to one man's witnesses in all the cases. Only in certain cases. There are at least five verses in the Quran which speak <coughs> about the witnesses without specifying male or female. In one place, there is an indication in which two women witnesses is equal to one witness of man and that's in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 282, which happens to be the longest verse of the Quran. It says that when you involve in financial transactions in which future obligations are there, reduce them in writing and take two witnesses among the men. If you can't, sorry, if you can't find two men witnesses, take one man and two women so that if one of them gets confused, the other will remind her. This verse of the Quran, for Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 22, only deals with financial aspects. Only in financial aspects it is said that take two men as witnesses, preferable. Only if you can't find two men as witnesses, take one man and two women. Let me give you an example for a better understanding. Suppose a person wants to undergo a surgery. He wants to undergo an operation. But naturally, he would prefer taking the advice of two qualified surgeons. If he cannot find two qualified surgeons, he would take the advice of one qualified surgeon at least backed with two normal general practitioners who have got a normal MBBS degree. Because a surgeon is more qualified in the field of surgery as compared to a plain MBBS doctor. In the same fashion, since the responsibility of the financial aspects has been laid on the shoulders of the man in Islam, he is more well versed in finance as compared to the woman. That's why the best option for witnesses in financial transactions is two men. If you can't find two men, then one woman, sorry, one man and two women. Again, if you read in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 106, it says that when anyone writes a will of inheritance, take two men as witnesses. Again, dealing with financial transactions, men are preferred. Some of the jurists say that even while giving witnesses, 
in cases of murder, the feminine nature may obstruct her and she may get scared in cases of murder. That's why even in cases of murder, two women witnesses are equal to one witness of man. Only under these two conditions, the finance and cases of murder, are two women witnesses equal to one. Some of the scholars say no. Islam says, one place in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 282, that two women equal to one man, therefore under all circumstances, two women is always equal to one man. Let's analyze. As, as I said, let's analyze the Quran as a whole. If you read the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 6, it states that if any of you put a charge against your spouse, and if they have no evidence, if they have no evidence, their solitary evidence is sufficient. Means if a husband wants to put a charge against the wife, or the wife has to put a charge against the husband, if they have got no witnesses, their solitary evidence is sufficient. This verse clearly indicates that one woman witness is equal to one witness of man. There are several cases which the jurists agree that even in cases of sighting of moon, one woman witness is sufficient. Some jurists say that in the beginning of Ramzan, one witness is required. At the end of Ramzan, two witnesses are required. It does not make a difference whether they are man or woman. There are certain cases in which man's witness cannot be accepted. Only woman's witness is accepted. All are waiting for the answer, I believe. Suppose you want to give a witness for the burial bath of a woman. After a woman dies, the witness for a burial bath can only be given by a woman. And only in extreme cases, when you can't find women, then can the husband give the witness. So here, the woman witness is preferable. Hope that clarifies that out, brother. Uh, one, uh, those who are interested in writing question on the slips, you may kindly raise your hand so that we have assistants standing around. They could come and help you out with a slip of paper or a pen or whatever is required. So that, uh, and it can be passed on down the sides of the stage to me. So we can carry on as a secondary preference later on. Uh, may we have the next question from the sister on the top, please? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shaila. I would like, to, I would like to ask, why is polygamy permitted in Islam? And uh, that is why is a man allowed to marry more than one wife? Sister asked the question that why is polygamy permitted in Islam? That is, why is a man allowed to marry more than one wife in Islam? The polygamy actually means that a person who has more than one spouse is divided into two categories. Polygyny, in which a man has more than one wife. And polyandry, in which a woman has got more than one husband. People normally think polygamy means a man can marry, man can marry more than one wife. Polygamy means both. A person having more than one spouse. If a man has more than one wife, it's called polygyny. And if a woman has more than one husband, it's called polyandry. But since the sisters mainly ask the question, why is a man allowed to marry more than one wife? I will answer, why is polygyny allowed in Islam? Quran happens to be the only religious book on the face of the earth which says, marry only one. There is no religious book on the face of the earth which says, marry only one. You read the Gita, you read the Veda, you read the Ramayana, you read the Mahabharata, you read the Bible, nowhere is it mentioned, marry only one. It's only mentioned in the Quran. In fact, if you read the Hindu scriptures, most of the, most of the kings had several wives. King Dashrath had more than one wife. Lord Krishna had several wives. If you read the Jewish scriptures, the Jewish law allowed polygyny. It was only in the 11th century when Rabbi Gershom ben Yehuda, he passed a synod and said polygyny should not be allowed. Still it was practiced by the Socratic 
Jewish community in the Muslim countries. Until in 1950, the chief rabbi knight of Israel put a ban on it. The Christian Bible allows polygyny. Only a couple of centuries ago, the church put a ban on it. Even if you analyze the legal aspect of India, the Indian law allowed a Hindu man to have more than one wife. It was only in 1954 when the Hindu Marriage Act was passed. And if I'm wrong, Justice Kazi can correct me. When the Hindu Marriage Act was passed in 1954, which put a ban and prohibited the Hindu man to marry more than one wife. If you see the statistics, according to a committee report on the status of women in Islam, which was published in 1975 on page number 66 and 67, it states the percentage of, of polygamous marriages. And it says that the percentage in which the Hindu did polygamous marriages, it was 5.06. And the percentage of Muslim polygamous marriages was only 4.31. Let's leave the statistic aside. Let's come to the main point. Why does Islam allow polygyny? As I mentioned earlier, Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which says marry only one. It's mentioned through Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 3, that you can marry a woman of your choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. The statement, marry only one, is only given in the Quran. It's not there in any other religious books. In pre-Islamic Arabia, men had several wives. Some people had hundreds of wives. Islam put an upper limit to polygamy, maximum four. And you can have more than one wife only on the condition that you can do equal justice between the two or between the three or four. Otherwise, only one. And the same surah, Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 129 says that it is very difficult for a man to be just between his wives. So polygamy is an exception. It is not the rule. Many people think that Islam says we should compulsory marry more than one wife. There are five categories of do's and don'ts in Islam. First category is compulsory which is first. The second category is recommended or encouraged. The third category is the permissible category. The fourth category is the discouraged category. And the last is prohibited or forbidden. Polygyny falls in the middle category of permissible. There is no statement in any hadith on the Quran which says that if a man marries more than one wife, he is a better Muslim than a person who marries only one wife. Let's analyze logically. Why does Islam allow a man to marry more than one wife? By nature, men and women are born, male and female are born in equal proportion. But medical science tells us that the fetus, if it's a female, is more stronger than the male fetus. Pediatric knowledge tells us that a female child has got more resistance than the male child. A female child can fight germs and disease much more stronger and a better way than the male child. Medical science tells us that the female is health-wise a stronger sex than the male. So, in the pediatric age itself, the female ratio is higher than the male ratio. Wars take place in the world. And during wars, more male are killed than the female. Even the recent war which took place in Afghanistan, approximately more than one and a half million people were martyred, out of which most of them were men.
statistics tells us that accidents take place. More of the men die in accidents than the females. More male death takes place due to cigarette smoking than female death. Therefore, we have more female in the world as compared to the male. India is one of the countries, besides a few of the Asian countries and Africa, in which the female population is more than the male population. And the reason I have given you, because more than one million fetuses are female fetuses are being aborted every year. And because of the high rate of infanticide, female infanticide, that's the reason that females are less than the male. Otherwise, you stop this evil practice and within a few decades you'll have that the male population is, will become much less than the female population. In New York alone, there are 1 million females more than male. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million females more than male. And out of the male population of New York, one third are gay. They are photomites. That means they can't find female partners. And there are more than 25 million gays in America. In Britain alone, there are more than 4 million females more than male. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than male. In Russia alone, there are 7 million females more than male. And God knows how many million females are there more than the male in this whole world. If suppose, my sister happens to live in America. And suppose the market is saturated. Every man has found a female partner for himself. Still, there will be more than 30 million females in USA alone who will not be able to find husband. And suppose my sister who is living in America happens to be among the unfortunate ladies who has not found a partner yet. The only option remaining for her is that she either marries a husband, she marries a man who already has a wife or she becomes public property. There is no third option. And believe me, I have posed this question to hundreds of non-Muslims and everyone opted for the first. No one so far has opted for the second. But there are some people who are smart and he said that I would prefer my sister remaining a virgin. Believe me, medical science tells us that a man or a woman cannot remain a virgin throughout a life. She cannot remain a virgin throughout her life without indulging in illicit sex or sexual perversions because daily sex hormones are being liberated in the body. And those great men who claim to have renounced the world, for example, the sages and the sons who go to mountains and Himalayas, behind them you find the Devdas is going. For what? <laughs> according to a report, according to a report, out of the priests and the nuns of the Church of England, the majority indulge in fornication and homosexuality. There is no option, there is no third option. The only option is that you marry a husband who already has a wife or you become public property. Uh, in, 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 continuation, in continuation of that question, uh, we have got a question on the slip. Can you enumerate the various conditions in which Polygamy is permitted. This is from Sister Samina. Can you enumerate the various conditions in which polygamy is permitted? So sister, has a, <coughs> sister has a question that can you enumerate the various conditions in which polygyny is permitted? The only condition which allows a man to marry more than one wife is that he should do justice between the two wives. If he can do justice, between the two or three or four wives that he has, he is allowed to take more than one wife. If he can't do justice, he should suffice with only one wife. But there are several conditions in which it is more advisable for a man to take more than one wife. One of the examples I gave is because of 
the surplus women which can't find husbands, Islam is allowed polygyny to protect the modesty of the women. There are several other conditions, for example, suppose a young lady, she gets married and within maybe approximately a few months of a marriage, she has an accident and she gets handicapped and she cannot satisfy the husband. The only option for the husband is that he either keeps his first wife with a handicap and takes another wife or he divorces the first wife and marries a new wife. I am telling you, suppose your sister happens to be that unfortunate lady who gets handicapped, which would you prefer? Would you prefer your brother-in-law to divorce her and to marry a new wife or would you prefer your brother-in-law to keep that first wife and to take another wife? There are situations in which the wife can become seriously ill. She can have a disease in which she will not be able to look after the children or look after the husband. Under such conditions, it is more advisable that that wife shares the husband with another lady who will not only look after the husband, will also look after her as well as the children. Many people may argue that why can't you keep a maid servant or a nurse who look after the children. I do agree with you. You can very well keep a maid servant who will look after your children and your wife. But who will look after you then? Very soon that maid servant will start looking after you also. So the best option is that you keep your first wife and take another wife and treat both of them equally. There can be conditions such as after several years of marriage you have got no children and maybe both the husband and wife they yearn for a child the wife can very well give permission to the husband to marry another wife and they can have more children some people may argue that why don't you adopt a child Islam does not allow adoption for which there are several reasons I won't go into that the only option remaining here is that he either divorces the first wife and takes another wife if you want children, or he keeps the first wife and takes another wife and treats okay. both of them equally. I hope these are sufficient reasons. The next question from the brother on the left. My name is Ilyas and uh, I'm a student. The question is, the question, the question is, um, uh, can a woman become the head of the state? A bit louder, please. Can the woman become the head of the state? The brother asked the question. <coughs> Can a woman become the head of a state? There is no text in the Quran which I know which states that a woman cannot become a head of a state. But there are several hadiths. For example, one hadith says that the people who have the leader as a woman will not succeed. Some of the scholars say that this only refers to a particular time in which the hadith was related, especially at the time when Persia had the leader as the queen. The other scholars say no, it refers to all the time. Let's analyze whether it is advisable for a woman to be a head of a state or not. If a woman is head of a state in an Islamic country, she may have to lead the congregational prayers. And if a woman leads the congregational prayers in Islam, we adopt several postures like Qayyam Ruku Sujood, standing, bowing and prostration. If a lady is doing that in front of a gent congregation, I'm surely it will cause disturbances in the prayers. If she happens to be head of a state of a modern society like the one we have today, Many a time, the head of a state has to have meetings with other heads of state which are usually gents. And many a times they have closed door meetings in which no one else is allowed. And if a woman has a closed door meeting with another gent, Islam does not permit to do that. Islam does not permit a woman to be alone with a nahmaram, with a foreign male, in closed doors. 
Islam does not permit intermingling of sexes. The head of the state many times receives all publicity by video shooting and the photography and many times it involves in close proximity with the other heads of state and with other gentlemen. Therefore you can see photographs of the heads of state if it's a lady, may it be Margaret Thatcher or anyone else, you find a photograph shaking hands with many men. Islam does not allow such free intermingling of sexes. The head of the state requires that it should meet the common man. A lady, if she's the head of the state, it would be difficult for her to meet the common man and try and solve a problem. And science tells us that a woman, during a menstrual period, she undergoes certain behaviors, mental and psychological changes due to the release of the sex hormone estrogen. And these changes will surely disturb her in making decisions if she's the head of the state. Science also tells us that the woman has more verbal and more verbal and vocal skills as compared to the man. And a man has got more spatial ability. Spatial ability means the ability to imagine things, to imagine the future, to imagine a future project. And spatial ability is very important for the head of the state. A woman has been given an edge over the men in verbal and vocal skills which are required for a motherhood. A woman, she may get pregnant and surely she may require rest for a few months. Who will look after the state for the few months? She may have children. Her duty as a mother is very important. And it is more practicable for a man who can do both the duties of a father as well as the head of a state as compared to a woman if she has to do the duty of a mother as well as the head of state. So I am more inclined to those scholars who say that women should not be made the head of state. But that does not mean that women cannot take part in making decisions. As I mentioned in my speech, they have a right to vote, they have a right to take part in lawmaking. During the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Umm Salma, may Allah be pleased with her, she supported and guided the Prophet at a time when the whole Muslim community was disturbed. She guided him and she supported him. As you know that though the Prime Minister or the President may be the head of the state, but many a time the PAs and the secretaries, they are the ones who make the decision. So surely a woman can help the man in making decisions of the state. I hope that answers the question. The next question. I'm Vimla Dalal, advocate. I would like to ask that if Islam preaches women's rights are equal to men. Why women should be in Parta and why there should be a segregation of men and women in this sort of meeting also? Sister asked a very good question that when Islam believes in women's rights that men and women should be equal, then why does Islam believe in Parda and why should there be segregation of sexes like the one we are having just now? As I mentioned earlier, Islam does not believe in intermingling of the sexes. Why Islam specifies parda, I will answer in a short time. And I'd like to thank the sister because I did not have time to speak on the hijab of the woman. If you read the Quran, before the mentioning of the hijab for the woman, the Quran mentions the hijab for the man. It's mentioned through Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30. It says, Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. The next verse, Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 31 says, Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not a beauty, except what is that necessary of. 
and would drop a head covering over a bosom, except in front of a father, a son, a husband, and a big list of Nasserim, the close relatives who she cannot marry is given, and butt natures in front of the chaste woman. Besides these, she should maintain the hijab. The criteria for hijab in Islam can be found in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. There are six criteria. First is the extent, which is the only difference between the man and the woman. For the man, he has to be covered from the navel to the knee. For the woman, her complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen, not should be seen, is the face and the hand up to the wrist. If she wishes to cover them, she is most welcome, but not compulsory that she should cover it. Otherwise, the full body should be covered. The only part that can be seen, not should be seen, is the face and the wrist, the hand up to the wrist. This is the only criteria which differs between the man and the woman. The second criteria is that the clothes she wears should not be so tight that it reveals the figure. The clothes she wears, third point, it should not be so transparent so that you can see through. And the fourth point, she should not wear glamorous clothes or he should not wear glamorous clothes which attracts the opposite sex. The fifth point is that a person should not wear clothes which resemble that of the opposite sex like you find men wearing earrings. If you wear one earring, it signifies something else. If you wear two earrings, it signifies something else. It's private in Islam. And the last criteria is, you should not wear clothes with that resemble of an unbeliever. These are the six basic criteria of hijab in Islam. Now coming to the question, why does Islam believe in parda and why are the segregation of sexes? If, let's analyze the society in which there is parda and society in which there is no parda. The maximum number of crime that takes place in any country is in America. According to a report by the FBI, in 1990, in the year 1990, 1,255 women were raped. These are only the reported cases. And the report says only 16% of the cases were reported. If you want the exact figure, multiply 1,2555 with 6.25 and you get the answer, more than 6,40,000 ladies were raped in America only in 1990. And if you divide by the number of days, divide by 365, you get a figure of 1,756 women are raped every day in America in the year 1990. And the report says, every day 1,900 ladies are raped. Maybe it's the report of 1991. The American got more bold. And the last report, which came in autumn 1993, said, every 1.3 minutes, one woman is raped. You know why? America has given the women more rights, and more women are being raped. Only 10 were arrested. 16% are reported. Only 10% are arrested, means only 1.6% of the cases are arrested. Out of that, 50% are let free before the trial, means only 0.8% of the rape cases are held. Means, if a man rapes 125 ladies, the chances of his being caught is 1. Who would like to try? 125 ladies you rape? and you get caught only once. Out of that, 50% times you get a punishment of less than one year. Though the USA law tells you that for rape, you have got a punishment of life imprisonment. But they say it happened only the first time. He's caught the first time. Let him give him a chance. And a punishment of less than one year. Even in India, according to the National Crime Bureau report, which was which had come in the papers in the 1st of December 1992. It said that every 54 minutes, one case of rape is reported in India. Reported, no? Every 26 minutes, one case of molestation. Every 1 hour 43 minutes, one case of dowry death. 
if you analyze the total number of cases of rape that are taking in a country, it will be every couple of minutes one case of rape. I am asking a simple question. If you ask every lady to do hijab, will the rape case in USA remain the same? Will it decrease or will it increase? If you apply the hijab for every lady in India, will the rate of rape decrease? Will it remain the same or will it increase? We should understand Islam as a whole. Even suppose after that, even after a lady does hijab, irrespective of a lady does hijab or not, a man is commanded, he should lower his gaze. And if suppose after that, if a man commits rape in Islam, he receives capital punishment. You call it a barbaric law. I have asked this question to several people. Suppose, I have asked this question to many of the gents. Suppose your sister is raped, and if you are made the judge, leave aside what Islam tells you, leave aside what Indian law tells you, leave aside what American law tells you, if you are made the judge, what punishment will you give to the rapist of a sister? And all have said, death sentence. Few went to the extreme of saying, I'll torture him to death. I want to ask you a question. If you apply the Islamic Sharia law in America, will the rape case decrease? Will it remain the same or will it increase? If you apply the Sharia law in India, will the rape case decrease? Will it remain the same or will it increase? So, but natural, let and let practically. You say you are giving women rights theoretically, but practically you are degrading her to a status of a concubine and a mistress. I'd like to, I mean only on speaking on Parda, you can talk for days. Just, I'd like to end my answer by giving a small example. Suppose two ladies, two twin sisters, who are equally beautiful, if they are walking down the street. And around the corner, there is a hooligan who is waiting for a catch who is waiting to tease a girl. Both twin sisters are walking, both are equally beautiful. One is in the hijab, Islamic hijab, one is wearing a mini or a skirt. Which girl will that hooligan tease? Which girl will he tease? But that is the one in the short of the mini. If a girl is wearing normal shawar kameez with the hair open, maybe the shawar kameez tight, and the other girl is wearing Islamic hijab, which girl will he tease? But that is the girl who is not in hijab. So it's practical proof that hijab is been ordained in Islam not to degrade the woman, but to protect her modesty. There is an announcement for Aruna Bhurte. Your husband is calling you at the entrance, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Aruna Bhurte. Could you please contact your hand, uh, husband outside the auditorium, please? The next question. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Bilal Lala and I am a revert. By profession, I happen to be a lecturer in computers. There is one question which has baffled me over the years, and that question is why does Islam permit a Muslim man to marry a woman of his choice from Ahle Kitab, maybe Jews or Christians, and the vice versa is not permitted? Are the Muslim ladies not Muslims? Can you clarify? So the Bilal has asked the question that Quran permits a Muslim man to marry a lady from the Ali Kitab, but the vice versa is not true, and it's correct. It's mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 5, that on this day it has been made lawful for you all that is good and pure. The food of the people of the book has been made lawful for you and your food has been made lawful to them and also besides the women who are believers even the women of the Ahle Kitab who are chaste has been made lawful for you if Islam gives permission for a Muslim man to marry a woman from the Ahle Kitab why? because when a Christian or a Jewish lady, when she marries a Muslim man, after she marries, the family of the husband will not abuse or insult any of her prophets. Because in Islam, we believe in all the prophets of the Jews and the Christians. 
What prophet they believe in, we believe in. We both believe in Adam, in Noah, in David, in Musa, in Isa. May peace be upon them all. Because we believe in all of the prophets, the lady when she enters the Muslim family, she will not be ridiculed. But the vice versa, if a Muslim lady goes to a family of a Christian or a Jew, but natural, they do not believe in Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, and she will be ridiculed. That's why Islam gets permission for a Muslim man to marry a girl from the Ali Kitab, but the vice versa is not true. Coming to the second part of the question, that aren't these Muslim women mushriks? Brother is referring to an ayat of the Quran Sharif of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, which says that do not marry unbelieving women until they believe. Even a slave woman who is a believer is better than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. Means, even if the Queen of England, let her be the wealthiest lady, let the lady be the most beautiful in the world. Still, a jhadu ali, a slave woman who is a believer is much better than the best lady of the world if she is an unbeliever. And the host continues, do not marry your daughters to the unbelieving man until you believe. For a slave man who is a believer is better than an unbeliever even if he allows you. Now another verse in the Quran tells you, from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, it says, لَقَدْ كَفَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ سَبْنُ مَرْيَمَ That they are blaspheming, they are doing kufr, those who say, Jesus is Christ, the son of Mary. Those who say, Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. لَقَدْ كَفَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ سَبْنُ مَرْيَمَ وَالْقَالَ الْمَسِيحِ But said Christ, Ya Ben Israel, Ocean of Israel, Abdu Allah, Worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord, إِنَّمَا يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ And anyone who associates, partners with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannah haram for him. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِزْوَارِ مِنْ مِنْ أَنْسَارِ And for him, he shall have no helpers, and fire shall be his dwelling place. From this verse you come to know, that all those who say, Allah is Christ, those who are saying, Jesus Christ may peace be upon him, his God, they are in kufr. And one verse of the Quran says, you are allowed to marry this kafir. You will think the Quran is contradicting itself. But as I told you, analyze the Quran as a whole. There is one more verse in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse 110, which says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. Oh yeah, the best of people you are for mankind. Ta'amiruna bil ma'aruf yiva tanhauna ani munkar. You are for mankind. Enjoying what is good and forgetting what is good. Bad. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. Ta'amiruna bil ma'aruf yiva tanhauna ani munkar. Fatuminuna billah. And believing in Allah. Walau amana ahlul kitab lakana khaira lahum. It would have been better if the people of the book had faith. Minumul mu'minuna wa akhtarumul fasikun. Among them, there are some who are mu'min. Among the Ahli Kitab, there are some who are believers, but the majority are poverty transgressors. So Quran says, you are allowed to marry the woman from the Ahli Kitab who are believers, who are mu'min, who do not believe that Jesus Christ may peace be upon him is God or son of God, but to believe that Jesus Christ may peace be upon him is a messenger of God and they believe in only one God. Hope that answers the question. The next question please. Assalamu alaikum. I am Akela Fatar Pekar, from the government of Maharashtra, the Under Secretary. My question is, in Islam, a woman, whether she is a married woman or a married woman, does not have to win her permission. Why is this? And if it is, please give her details. So, sir, I pose a question that, why in Islam, whether a woman is married or unmarried, she is not allowed to make a will. It is completely wrong. It's, as I mentioned in my lecture, Islam gave economical rights to women 1300 years before the West. And I said very clearly in my talk that any adult woman who is mature, but naturally, if she is not an adult, she cannot practice because she cannot practice the right because she won't be matured. 
any adult woman, irrespective whether she's married or unmarried, has the right to own or dispose any of her property without consultation. If she wants, she can take consultation. If she wants, she need not. She has the right to even make a will. Islam does not prohibit her that. I hope that answers the question. Uh, no, uh, excuse me, sir. We'll allow questions only from the mic. And in turn, please, we have to keep the decorum by the people who have stood for some time. The next question, please. My name is Roshan Nangwala, a businessman. Question is, uh, as you said that Islam gives equal right to both ladies and gents, then why men is allowed to keep four wives and ladies are kept away from this privilege? As men can think of another woman, at the same time, after marrying a, one wife, men can think for another woman, why ladies cannot think for another? The brother asked the question that since Islam allows polygyny, why does not, why does not Islam allow polyandry? A man is allowed to marry more than one wife, why isn't a woman allowed to marry more than one husband? Firstly, you should realize that man is more sexual than the woman. Point number two, biologically, a man can perform his duty as a husband even after he has more than one wife, which a woman, if she has more than one husband, she will not be able to perform her duties as a wife enough and satisfactorily. Medical science tells us that the lady during a menstrual period undergoes certain behavioral and psychological changes in which she is mentally disturbed. And therefore, the majority of the quarrels, the majority of the quarrels that take place take place during the menstrual period. According to a report of the criminal record of the women in USA, most of the ladies that committed the crime was during the menstrual period. Therefore, for a wife, if she has more than one husband, to mentally adjust will be more difficult. Medical science also tells us that if a lady has more than one husband, she has chances of acquiring sexually transmitted diseases as well as venereal diseases and she can transmit it back to the husband, which is not the case if a husband has more than one wife. And suppose a man who has more than one wife, if he marries and if he has children, the identification of both the parents is possible. The father can be identified as well as the mother can be identified. In the other case, if a wife has more than one husband, you will only identify the mother, not the father. <laughs> Islam gives utmost importance to identification of the parents. And psychologists tell us that if a child cannot identify his parents, he undergoes mental trauma. No wonder the children of the prostitutes, they have a very bad childhood. And if that child goes for admission in the school, and if he's asked, what's the name of your father? You'll have to give two names. And you know what the child is called. There are several reasons why polyandry is not allowed. And for counter argument, if you tell me that I give you several reasons why poly polygyny is allowed. For example, if a person does, if a couple does not have issue, and if they marry, a man is allowed to take more than one wife. If suppose the husband is sterile, can the wife take more than one husband? No, because no doctor can give you the guarantee that the husband is 100% sterile. Even if you do vasectomy, even if you do nasbandi, no doctor can tell you that the child cannot be a father. So still, again, the, identif the identification of the child is yet in doubt. In the other case, suppose the husband, he undergoes an accident or he becomes very severely ill. Can the wife take care of the husband? 
let's analyze. Suppose the husband, if he undergoes an accident, or if he severely ill, he cannot perform his duty very well. Firstly, of the financial aspect, he will not be able to look after the family, the children and the wife, and secondly, he may not be able to satisfy the wife. Regarding the first criteria, where he cannot satisfy the children and the wife, Islam has an option. Islam allows such people to take zakat. Those people who can't make both their ends meet, they can make zakat. And the second aspect, medical science tells us that a wife requires less condition to be satisfied as compared to a husband. But still, if the wife still wants to, still if she's not satisfied, she has all the reason to take kula from the husband and marry another husband. Here, a wife taking kula is much more preferred because here when the wife is getting divorced, she is healthy. In the other case, if she is disabled, if she is handicapped, if she is divorced, who will marry her? Hope that answers the question. I'm Next Sir Dadu Hakeem. I would like okay. to ask a uh, question. The first thing is, here you have a subject, women's rights in Islam. There, I think more women should have asked more questions and it could have been better rights and duties of men, that subject would have been better. But the question is, you said in your speech, it was very lucid and nice, that a girl can say no if she doesn't want to marry a particular person. But while saying, uh, speaking in your lecture, you have said that a woman cannot be economically independent in the sense she cannot earn. And can these people, when a girl says no, look after the child, say nicely, she is always going to be under the mercy of the male folk under these circumstances. I would like to know what is the answer. Question here. Uh, excuse me, can you put your question in just two or three, like what answer you want? We would request uh, all the questioners that you present your question, the basic background of problems in society. I believe Dr. Zakir would be having an idea about it. You kindly state your question. What is the question? My question is that you said that a girl can say no if she doesn't want to marry a particular person. But the male folk are feeding her, looking after her, she is dependent on them. Can she exist safely after saying no? This is the question that I said in my lecture that a woman has a right to say no for marriage. But will she be able to safely exist after saying no? You didn't pay attention to my full lecture, sister. In my lecture I said, if the duty of the man in the family before marriage it's the duty of the father and the brother to look after her lodging, clothing, boarding and financial aspects. And after marriage, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after financial aspects. So if she says no, yet it, it continues to be the duty of the father and the brother to look after her. She can very well say no. I don't know what's the problem. The next question, please. I am Prakash Bhutte. First of all, I will thank organizers for calling people of all faiths. And so I am asking another question. For all the religions, whether it is Hinduism, Christian or Islam, in books there are many good things. But for years, after thousands of years, the practices of all the religions have been discriminatory towards women. And no religion is an exception to this. So the question is, what is written in the books, whether it is Bible, Quran or Gita or whatever it is, whether that is more important or the practice of the society which is more important. And if practice is more important, then we should give very little importance to what is being written in all such holy books, including Quran, Gita or whatever it is. So on this, uh, I expect answer there in practice what could be done instead of saying what is being written in this book or that book. That's how yes. Thank you. The brother asked a very good question. He says that all the scriptures speak about good things, but let's see what people practice. We have to pay more importance to the practice than the theoretical things. And I do agree with him. What we are doing here is that I have said in my lecture that many Muslim societies have deviated away from the Quran and the Sunnah. What we are doing here is they are calling the people to come closer to the Quran and Sunnah.
and regarding a first of the question that all religious pictures, all religious scriptures speak good. So it's useless talking about religious scriptures. I don't agree with you. I have given a lecture on status of women in Islam and other religions. And I've compared the status of women in Islam as compared to Hinduism, to Buddhism, to Christianity, and to Dress, and to Judaism. And there I've compared. And you yourself can be the judge if you have opportunity to hear that lecture. You can hear that lecture. You yourself can judge which religion gives the maximum right. Even if you agree theoretically, Islam gives the maximum right. Now we have to practically follow it. There are people who are following certain aspects. Certain aspects people aren't following. For example, the Islamic law, where it comes to criminal punishment and civil rights, Saudi, Saudi government is doing very good, Alhamdulillah. Even they are deviating away from the Quran in certain aspects. What we have to do is we have to take the practical example of Saudi government as an Islamic law of criminal punishment and if it's practicable, apply it throughout the world and check another society which is practicing the Islamic law in the social aspect and if it's the best, you apply it to the other world. What we have gathered here, brother, is to make you realize this law is the best law. If we are not putting in practice, we are to blame, not the religion. So that's why we have called the people so that they will understand Quran and the Hadith in the right practice. They will understand Quran and the Hadith in the right way and put it into practice. I hope that answers the question. The next question from the top, please.